nothing like a vacation to re-energize you. I feel like I could tackle anything the bad musical world could throw at me. Come on, what's next on the case list? Hit me! Allow me to rephrase that. I could tackle anything the bad musical world could throw at me except Pokemon Live. Why not? Seriously? In the first place, Pokemon has never been my thing, and I only have the roughest outline of the concept and characters to go on. Second, while the most well-known recorded footage isn't exactly a bootleg, it's nearly the same in terms of quality. And I'm not sure what can be said about a musical based on a franchise that is basically dogfighting with adorable anime creatures. Why do the Underlords send me this? <laughs> yes, I'm well aware that live-action Pikachu movie comes out this month, but since when has this series ever done corporate synergy? <sighs> be honest. This is my punishment for taking a month off, isn't it? <laughs> Still, worth it. So yeah, this is a touring production that entertained kitties in 2000 and 2001, and is more or less based on the television series which was having its heyday at the time. It's pretty similar to a lot of kids' media tie-in live shows, with a couple notable exceptions. First, it actually has something of a plot and character development going on. Second, it has been preserved for posterity thanks to one Chris Mitchell, who was the production stage manager on the tour and provided the video and script for public consumption. Third, it features Andrew Rannells, of all people, as the character James, a role that he considers so embarrassing that being in a porno or snuff film would have been preferable. Let's examine the case of Pokemon Live and see if he's right. The story begins with the announcement of a competition for a one-of-a-kind diamond badge, which can only be earned by defeating its mysterious owner in ritual Pokémon combat. As one does. This is, of course, the sort of thing that gets the attention of our protagonist, Ash, who begs off on an outing with his mom, Delia, and their friend, Professor Oak, to go on the hunt. It is not every day a world-renowned Pokémon expert personally invites us to his lecture on sleep disorders among the Snorlax! Yeah, this is definitely the kind of thing you're not going to be interested in if you're not 100% invested in Pokemon already. Delia is not entirely comfortable with her son's Pokemon catching career, mainly because it keeps bringing him into contact with the villainous Team Rocket, with which she has a vaguely foreshadowed connection. But still, she leaves Ash to his devices, which mainly involve dorky dancing. I will travel across the land. Fortunately, this case of terminal whiteness is interrupted by Ash's friends Misty and Brock. Misty is rather shirty about Ash's intention to go after the diamond badge with his oversized Pikachu since he forgot about her birthday for the past two weeks. But Ash is determined to do this not only for himself, but his Pokemon servants, which he rhapsodizes about in Sin Number 1, You and Me and Pokemon. Cross every river Behind every tree On top of every mountain They're a part of you and me This sounds like a rejected song from The Lion King. Speaking of which, there's a sub-Circle of Life parade, which is right about where this show goes from not my thing to not my thing, but also hilariously bad. Go back! Dodrio! Uh, how many Pokemon are there again? Oh, sweet Lucifer, this is going to take forever. But at last it ends, and we switch over to the nefarious doings of Team Rocket lackeys Jesse and James and their snarky cat Pokemon thing Meowth. So far, nefarious doings involves a lot of fourth wall breaking. You know, these... Milwaukee fans are pretty wimpy! The kids in New York yelled a whole lot louder. After that painful cover for a scene change, we get some exposition from Team Rocket boss Giovanni. It seems he's created a robotic Pokémon called Mecha Mew 2, which can absorb and learn any attack that gets thrown at it. The ultimate goal being, what else, world domination. Let the universe prepare, good Pokémon beware, you fools. Shall not 
deny me. Well, give the bad guys some credit. They know exactly what kind of show they're in and are refusing to take it seriously. Giovanni orders his minions to nab him a Pikachu so his new toy can learn some electric abilities, and James and Jesse set out to do their dirty work. By which I mean dated for the parents' jokes and even more dated musical stylings. The world from dead to unite all peoples within our nation. To denounce the evils of Chernobyl. To extend our reach to the stars above. That's it. I hereby declare a moratorium on all rap breaks in children's media. Unless they're written by Lin-Manuel Miranda and even he's skating on thin ice. Open up your eyes, gonna show you where it's at as we take a look around at a new habitat. After a short sequence of Mecha Mewtwo learning abilities from various puppets, we cut back to the heroes. Brock is flirting with random girls, Ash is obsessed with the diamond badge thing, and Misty thinks he needs to chill. I'm just going to assume these are their basic character traits from the series. It ends with Brock getting slapped a lot and a random friendship song. Yeah, not much to say about this one. It's a generic bestest buddies forever thing with random record scratches. Moving on. James and Jesse, but mostly Jesse, are setting up a Pikachu trap straight out of the Wile E. Coyote playbook. I gotta hand it to you guys. This might actually work. <laughs> Only if your quarry is Elmer Fudd. As it is, things go in a very predictable manner. Oh, I see the problem. We forgot to pull out the support stick. <laughs> Look at this. No, ah! don't. Meanwhile, well, that was Monty Python levels of random right there. Anyway, Professor Oak and Delia arrive at what he claims is the lecture hall address, but looks more like the place you'd find an illegal cockfighting ring. Or whatever the equivalent of illegal cockfighting is in a society built around getting small animals to fight each other. Illegal soccer matches, perhaps? Delia is having a midlife crisis about how Ash is growing up, and she's not ready for him to stop being her little boy, which is honestly weightier than I expected from the kind of show that sells overpriced snow cones and souvenir mugs. Not my little boy anymore. He's changing into something else or someone else. He's becoming a man. Oh, I don't want him to. Not yet. I'm not ready for that. Everything. Unfortunately, this is followed up by sin number three, Everything Changes. Everything Changes. Every so often, you come across a moment in a musical where you get a greater impact if people don't sing. Pierre's declaration in Great Comet, the first debate scene in 1776. And as it happens, this one. Throwing in a pseudo-inspirational piece with random dancers and more Pokemon name-dropping cheapens what was turning out to be a surprisingly moving scene. Fortunately, Giovanni enters to be evil all over the place. Turns out the lecture invitation was a trap to get renowned Pokemon expert Professor Oak in his clutches because, uh... Oh yeah, there's this bit with Delia, too. Oh, good to see you again. You look lovely. Leave her alone! So, Giovanni used to date Ash's mom? And he still has a thing for her? I... Look, I have no idea how this does or doesn't fit into the overall Pokemon mythos. There's an entire section of the internet devoted to sorting out this sort of thing. Go ask it for opinions. Elsewhere, Ash and his friends have been going around in circles because Brock lost the map while he was flirting with the ensemble players. Fortunately, they encounter another trainer with a map. Unfortunately, said trainer only speaks in sign language. Fortunately, Brock is fluent in ASL because... The point is, the deaf trainer agrees to share his map if Ash does battle with him, because that's how things get done around here. I, I choose J, P, pink, round. J, P, pink, round. J, P, hey, I choose Jigglypuff. No! no! Um, that's bad then? I'm fuzzy on the whole good bad thing. Okay, it is bad because Jigglypuff sings its opponents to sleep and then draws all over their faces. It's basically the world's worst slumber party guest. 
but at least Misty gets to sing a tender ballad about her unrequited love for Ash as a result. Why should anything so easy ever be so hard to do? This is the point when the Rugrats in the audience start squirming and asking when they can go get a popcorn refill. Anyway, more awkward ship teasing ensues, and it turns out Deaf Trainer was a good sport and left his map for the others to find, so off our heroes go! Oh, there it is! Pika! <laughs> Pika, Pika. It's beautiful! Yeah. I would have found it! Anyway, the conversation turns to which Pokémon Ash will use to battle for the Diamond Badge, and in case that wasn't completely obvious, we get sin number four, Pikachu! Pikachu! This is basically the saddest Gloria Stefan song in existence. And by the way, if you think Andrew Rannells has it bad, how embarrassing does it have to be for the person in the Pikachu costume? You're on stage most of the time, but all you get to do is stand around and occasionally bounce a little bit or shuffle your feet in an attempt to dance. It's not exactly War Horse, you know? James and Jesse, having been unhoisted from their own petard, intrude on the dance break to nab Pikachu, and despite being stymied by random dancers and Pikachu puppets, they are eventually successful in that endeavor. Guys, I can't find Pikachu anywhere! There's five of them behind you! What are you talking about? Anyway, that's a good time for... Act 2 opens with Dexter the Pokedex, or a human version thereof, I guess, regaling the audience with sin number 5, what kind of Pokemon are you? Pokemon masters in the house, come on, let's raise the roof! Kick your normal type, like Jigglypuff, against the ghostly Gengar, the battle's real tough! Hey, hey, what did I say about rap breaks? There's also some BuzzFeed-type quizzing of kids in the audience, which is about as awkward as you'd expect. Is your dad a Snorlax or a Ghastly? Snorlax. 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 Back at the actual plot, Ash figures Team Rocket has nabbed Pikachu, because really they're the only viable suspects at this point, but Misty suggests there might be other possibilities. You have a habit of ignoring your friends. Maybe Pikachu just got tired of it. Or maybe you missed his birthday, too. I have to say, this whole Misty's birthday thing isn't really doing it for me as far as her motivation goes. If Ash really is that much of an oblivious dick, then what does she see in him in the first place? Her suggestions seem to fall on deaf ears, but after running around the stage fails to produce Pikachu, Ash wonders if his friend has really gone on and sings a tender ballad for his favorite Electro Rabbit Mouse. We've gone so far and done so much and I feel like we've always been together Parents, now would be a good time to take the kids to the bathroom if they were telling you they didn't need to go at intermission. So after... <laughs> Help me out, people. Is this a running gag from the series? Kind of the equivalent of the bathing suit guy in the Dover Boys cartoon? Anyway, we turn to Delia and Professor Oak, caged up at Team Rocket headquarters, where Delia passes time by explaining her backstory with Giovanni. As a teenager, I fell in with a bad crowd, and there was just one boy. He started a gang that eventually became Team Rocket. The boy was Giovanni? Well, apparently the original draft of the script went farther than this, revealing that Giovanni is Ash's biological father. And there's still some subtext to that effect. Make of that what you will. Giovanni is a little hurt that Delia has well and truly turned her back on the evil thing, but he has gloating to do. One hand, ruling the planet each day, is mine to run. I gotta admit, I kinda like Giovanni. Sure, he's as cliche a villain as you can get without actually giving him a mustache to twirl, but even more damned if he isn't rocking it. And while I'm a little fuzzy on how this whole global domination through Pokemon training thing is supposed to work, giant powerful robots are a staple of rule the world plots, so I can roll with it. James and Jesse literally sashay on stage with the yellow shock rodent in tow, and Giovanni orders them to use Pikachu to attack Mecha Mewtwo. 
because he can't do Pokemon Battle against himself, and I don't know how the rules on this go. I'm just here for the ride. Again, this doesn't end well for the hench duo. The electricity opens the cages, somehow, and Delia and Professor Oak escape as Giovanni realizes he needs Pikachu's trainer to tell Pikachu what to do. Which seems obvious even to me, but whatever, Jesse and James are dispatched to go get Ash. And because nobody asked for it, we get a Brock solo. This song, Two Perfect Girls, doesn't really add anything other than a justification for Brock's rampant infidelity. Weird how that gets a pass and there are still parents flipping their shit over same-sex couples. Come on, woman, man, what I want to be, but the two perfect girls No, don't do that. Misty is at least as annoyed with this as I am. Boys, either you're off chasing every girl you see or you're ignoring us to spend time with your Pokémon. Well, there's a euphemism you don't hear every day. Brock and Misty go off, Delia and Oak come on. I swear this is starting to look like a particularly weird production of Into the Woods. Delia is worried about Ash getting hurt or finding out the truth of her past, more or less in that order, proving once again that her arc is the most interesting one in the show. And she angsts about that, while Misty angsts about her unrequited crush, and Ash angsts about being Pikachu-less, and once again, this is getting surprisingly weighty for a cartoon tie-in show. Every darkness has its dark, tears can't fall forever, so now I must move on. Having all turned up in the same clearing to sing a power ballad, Delia reveals Pikachu's whereabouts at Camp Team Rocket, and also her history with the villains. Ash takes this about as well as you'd expect, but then Jesse and James come in. On scooters, for some reason. We're taking you to Giovanni and Pikachu! Whether you like it or not. I like it. <gasps> you do? Uh, ooh, he does. Uh. Why is this being so easy? Look, just take the W on this one, you two. Based on the evidence I've seen, you're not going to get many of them that are this easy. Ash goes with them, leaving Delia to sing an angsty reprise. Exactly. Hey, it really is the swimsuit guy from the Dover Boys. Ash arrives at Giovanni's lair to find the villain monologuing to Mecha Mew 2, because this kind of cliched evil behavior doesn't just happen, you have to practice it diligently. They trade the usual formalities, Leave my mother out of this! Behold, my greatest creation! Giovanni lets Ash hold the diamond badge, figuring that's as close as he'll ever get to it, and they finally get down to battle. Ash and Pikachu get their asses handed to them, but Giovanni didn't count on Ash's mad song and dance skills. Oh no! You just can't win! You're not that strong! Time to pay for your sin! You got it all wrong! Look alive, girls! It's been a long time since we've had a good song fight! Having gotten the electric attack knowledge he needs, Giovanni orders Mecha Mewtwo to destroy Ash, but Ash is suddenly protected by a force field. How do we know this? Hey, it's a force field! Hyper Beam can't penetrate it! What's going on? The boy will not be harmed. Who said that? I did. You too! Hey, hey, no fair deus ex Pokemoning your way out of this. Mewtwo spams its robotic counterpart with something that's happening on the view screen we can't see from this angle, and Mega Mewtwo turns on its master. Giovanni, committed to his branding to the end, goes into YOU MUST OBEY ME mode. Dude, if you'd watched The Incredibles, you'd have known how this would turn out. From the boy, I've learned about love and goodness. His heart is pure. His love for Pokémon and his friends and family is real. I've learned right from wrong. And I've learned which one you are. Having learned the moral of the story, Mecha Mewtwo sets itself to self-destruct. Pikachu and Mewtwo take the unconscious Ash away, and Giovanni manages to exit stage right before his creation goes all splody. 
Too bad he doesn't get in an I'll get you next time! Ash wakes up surrounded by friends and family with no idea of what happened, but he has the diamond badge, so he figures it's a win. And he gives the badge to Misty as a birthday present, even though she didn't show any interest in it, and he pretty much ignored her in his pursuit of it, and whatever, happy group finale time. One world, one world. Pokemon Life is bad, but it's bad in the way nearly every other show of its type is bad. You don't go to something like this expecting Broadway. You go because your kids are interested in Pokemon and hopefully it'll entertain them for 90 minutes. And it actually does try to add some nuance and interesting character development, and even occasionally succeeds at it. Still, the whole concept of the franchise weirds me out, so the Court of Musical Hell condemns the Pokémon-verse to be liberated by the girl from the Radioactive video. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>